Uh, how you doing there? Uh, my name is Freeman Sullivan. I'm here uh, at the home of Peter Dale Scott, a, a former University of California Berkeley uh, professor of uh, English. Right. And uh, an author of some, several books, which we'll get into here um, right. in a minute. Recording from them later on. Good. And I just want to say this interview will be in English. Et je veux dire aux gens en France que je vous parle de Berkeley, en Californie, à Think of You, et je suis très content d'être capable de vous rejoindre aujourd'hui. Ok, there we go. Merci. Uh, so, uh, that for, just for that, and for the French-speaking uh, viewers out there, we will be running subtitles. Uh, and uh, Peter is a, an expert, basically, on... Uh, what would you say, conspiracy theories, or...? No, I'd say I study American foreign policy, and especially interventions and wars in other parts of the world. And uh, most notably the drug war? I've written a lot about drugs because uh, I've written mostly about smaller wars, the wars that are not financed directly by Congress, and which where America it wants to have a presence, say, in well, Southeast Asia, which is what I've been uh, writing about a lot. Uh, they rely on local forces who pay for themselves through being involved in drugs. The most spectacular example being in Laos in the 1960s, when in the end the CIA, I think, was overlooking an army of about 35,000 people. And Congress wasn't paying for it, the drug trade was paying for it. And uh, would you say that uh, similar circumstances are going on today in Afghanistan? Very much so, the whole government. I, I actually, in this book, uh, American War Machine, I have almost a chapter where I'm saying that what we're doing in, Laos, in Afghanistan now is what we did in Laos in the 60s. We, we, we installed a government uh, we give the government some aid, but we can't begin to uh, pay all the costs of the government. So uh, we accept a situation where the government is financing itself from the drug trade. Now, you keep, the Americans only hear that the Taliban are financing themselves from drugs, and it's true. Everybody's financing themselves by drugs. But uh, the estimates I come up with, with the help of a friend in this book, is that at the most, uh, all of the resistance forces, not just the Taliban, all of them command about 12% of the drug trade, and most of the rest of the drug trade is directly or indirectly going into the pockets of the Karzai regime. Karzai's brother has been identified both as a major trafficker and also as a CIA asset, <clears throat> and uh, other Karzai associates. And then there's kind of a network of people who used to be called warlords, and now we have a more polite term for them, local powers or things like that. But uh, their control of their regions is largely based on the drug trade. Okay. Um. And bringing that into perspective here, uh, just recently uh, Rios Montt, a uh, former dictator of Guatemala, was uh, funded with a lot of Ali North money that came down in the, uh, the early 80s, I believe, and uh, he was just recently convicted of genocide. Right. Well, the, the, uh, I once did a book, I didn't bring it out here, but I did a book on Iran-Contra, called the Iran-Contra Connection. The, um, there was... Uh, the, the Contras themselves uh, were, well, the, the main army were descendants of the former uh, legion under Samosa. And as long as Samosa was, the, well, it was a family. There were three of them, all dictators. Um, and they had this legion that backed them up. And as long as they were dictators, uh, drugs ran through Nicaragua, overseen by this uh, legion. So that when uh, the Samosas went, they changed their name to the September 15th group and then later on changed their name again. But they were a drug connection. And even bigger was that uh, these people had to be supplied and uh, the uh, CIA arranged for contracts to go to people who uh, were 
happy to supply the Contras because they would fly the planes in with arms from America and then they'd fly the planes back by, with drugs. And the drug, they, it was a well-established procedure. They would come into Fort Lauderdale Airport and there was a corner of the airport where uh, these, drugs, these planes would land and not be molested. And at the time, Senator Kerry found out about this and uh, tried to investigate these planes and the CIA um, gave them assurances that this wasn't happening and they were flat out lying. Okay. Uh, uh, and this brings it a calls into mind too. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with H HSBC Bank. Yes, in London, Chen, yes. And they were recently uh, uh, had a judgment declared against them, uh, which was only a tiny fraction of the money that they laundered. Um, and that uh, I think it's important. Maybe we should point out to the, to people that are watching is that it's not just people in the government and intelligence officers and dictators that are involved in this dirty business. But um, you know, uh, people that are out there watching has to remember that most of this money has to be laundered somehow, right? And it has to be reintegrated into the economy, and uh, so they're going to the uh, Wall Street, to and the big banks in Wall Street. Yes, uh, the uh, you know, it's not just a bank in London. There is the uh, perhaps the most spectacular confession was Wachovia Bank, which uh, it was closed down after this, but they. They admitted that there was $378 billion in accounts that they had not been monitoring through which drug money was. I think they paid a fine of $110 million or something, which again was a, fragment, a fraction of... And nobody ever went to jail. To, just to get a, si a sense of the size of this, $378 billion was something like, I think, a third of the annual budget of, of, of Mexico or something. Um, I don't think that the drug trade exists like this as a conscious intention at the beginning of a way of subsidizing the American economy, but it has worked out that way. What it began was, I think, was a way of uh, beefing up anti-communist forces around the world. We did it in Italy right after the war, we did it in France where the uh, CIA made alliances with uh, gangs that were already in the drug traffic. In uh, Southeast Asia, the CIA played a more active role because the drug trafficking in Southeast Asia up until the end of the war was not a significant factor in the world trade at all. Um, but the CIA wanted uh, to take the remnants of the Chinese anti-communist Kuomintang armies that had been driven out of China into Burma and Thailand. He wanted to build them up as an army to go back in. And it became evident immediately that they were no good as a fighting force, but they had had years of experience of controlling the local drug trade in that area. And one of the first, I think, uh, warlike actions after World War II was uh, the, uh, this KMT army uh, on behalf of Chiang Kai-shek invaded Laos in order to take the drug, the opium crop of that uh, particular year in Laos. That was in 1946. Well, we gave them a lot of arms. We uh, set up an airline. We created a CIA proprietary airline it was called CAT at the time, but most people remember it by its later name of Air America. And um, the CIA split the ownership with the KMT so that when they were flying the arms into these troops in Burma, they were CIA flights, but when the planes came back to either Bangkok or Taiwan with opium, those were KMT flights, so the CIA could say, well, that's not us. And people who say, well, the CIA turned a blind eye. I don't like that metaphor because the CIA had figured out the whole thing in advance. Okay, back again. Uh, uh, let's kind of change the subject now. We're talking about, let's talk about the United States. And uh, recently, uh, within the last year, the National Defense Authorization Act was passed. Right. And, uh, and what are your feelings on it? Well, they tried to say that, see, my feeling is that uh, 
for an Americans, it's very important that American citizens are surveilled or arrested. And uh, right after 9 11, there were any number of Muslims in this country that were uh, detained without warrants, uh, maybe 1,800 or something like that. I don't think we really know how many, a great many. And uh, the thing about this NDAA Act is that this will uh, extend now to Americans as well. And the administration has tried to say, oh no, that's not true. We're only going to go after people who are engaged in terrorist activity. But their definition of terrorist activity is so broad that it could cover you and I talking against the government. Not right at all. Right, and you know, so that um, it, what sounds like a defense is actually a, a revelation that there is no defense. Because if they really meant it not to apply to Americans, they would have said that in the act, and, and they clearly did not. And their, their attempt to reassure people, you don't have to worry because it's only people engaged in terrorist activities. They don't understand that terrorist activities, uh, I know, I, I know that I, for example, I'm a professor, I write books, but I'm listed on a website as a supporter of terrorists. Yeah, myself as well. I'm what you would call a non-violent terrorist. <laughs> okay, if there's ever a, a misnomer in terms um, that nowadays that you can be put on the list. Well, I like that know. because I think non-violence should strike terror into the hearts of people who are running this country because it's the, the saner way to run the world. and. Uh, in a sense, they're, fat, they're defending the old-fashioned way of just bombing and killing against the threat of nonviolence. Right, they use that, uh, that whole uh, designation against Occupy. Um, right, yes. And it was not just, it was around the world, and it was like amazing to me how coordinated these police efforts were, and it was like I was sitting there watching them on the live streams, and it was like city after city, and it was right. the same pattern. And then it was clearly evident to any person who's observant um, that uh, there had to be some kind of central planning that was involved. And uh, well, they admitted it, especially for the universities. There was a, a, a nationwide um, program for dealing with the universities. Yeah, the modern universities. And, and at Davis, you know, they had this. Uh, uh, they used the mace in the faces of yes. the people who were sitting. The chancellor there, I think, was on the nationwide committee of this uh, thing coordinating with the FBI. Yeah, they have to keep an eye on all the students. Well, they think they want to, we're talking about terrorizing. I think that these, um, what I, I think this really is, the, the planning for all of this, which I've written about, uh, it's called uh, <coughs> Continuity of government planning and the I like the Pentagon name for it, doom, the Doomsday Project because there is something really apocalyptic about it. It's like the end of democracy as we know it. All of this goes back to the 70s and the 60s when they had an anti-war movement which threatened, in their own eyes, to put, to put an end to the war. That, and later on, their assessment was that they lost Vietnam because of the anti-war movement. And what they want, more than anything else, I think, is to make sure that America will never again be inhibited in its actions overseas by a movement. So when putting mace in people's faces and things like that, stuff that's off the wall, is functional from their point of view because it means a lot of people are not going to want to go and sit down nonviolently uh, and protest things. Yeah, it scares people away. You don't. They don't. You have no idea what's going to happen to you. Pittsburgh, they uh, the sound cannons. They the sound cannons. Yes, and it was. Uh, they were mostly used uh, not against the the actual protest, which is more or less over by then. But they went onto a campus and found a whole lot of people who were just there. And use these can these cannons are so powerful that you 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 have to run away or you risk losing your hearing permanently, and not, just too. not just temporarily. And uh, and they rounded up all kinds of people. I actually spoke to a journalist who spent I think thirty six hours 
he, he had a press card and everything, but it, uh, they rounded him up too, creating an impression. It's, it's Kissinger's idea of be the crazy man, you know, and, and, and then people feel they better not mess with you. Yeah, that's kind of where we're at nowadays. Uh, and uh, also speaking about Davis, uh, and uh, this just could be in my I'm mind. I'm sure Mr. Schwab wants to know about Davis, but... Uh, yeah, well, we're talking about colleges and what, what goes on at, at colleges and the amount of uh, surveillance that goes on. And we're just talking about official government surveillance, right? right? With the cooperation of the authorities. And what people have to realize nowadays is that there's a shadow army that exists now, which is, is ten times the size of the, of the U.S. military and the CIA. Right. Um, and for instance, one of the world's most notorious corporations, Monsanto, uh, just recently bought XO, which used to be called Blackwater. That's, I did not that's not that. actually, it's, <coughs> that's been debunked. They didn't technically well, buy. Well, they're one of the majority shareholders right. of the company. But they're not. You own the yeah. Well, let's just, research. let's keep it, we'll draw back a bit. We have these private security companies right. now. Blackwater is the one that made the terrible headlines in Iraq. But there's Kraft International, and uh, there are any number. Pinkerton. I have a whole chapter in this book uh, yeah. about private intelligence companies, like SAIC uh, is the company that uh, uh, most people haven't heard of, but it, it, it affects American history. For example, it was the company that advised uh, the U.S. government on a contract that uh, Iraq possessed weapons of mass destruction, and it also uh, was put in charge by the U.S. government of trying to figure out why it was America had faulty intelligence in Iraq, and they failed to mention that they themselves had been the source of some of the faulty intelligence. And when you were talking about this huge army out there, they have these fusion centers, and the fusion center originally uh, if, you, if there was a problem of, uh, of security in, say, the city of Berkeley, well, then you would have the Berkeley police, or you would have the county sheriffs, or at really big level, you would have the state highway patrol. Now, the U.S. Army is involved. We, we have been, the United States has been a military district ever since 2002, right after 9-11. And the military is involved. There, there is at least one permanent brigade which is stationed in the United States for crowd control on a permanent basis, not in response to an emergency, but permanently there. And these fusion centers that are melding all the intelligence are working with the private corporations too, like SAIC. And this disturbs me very much because they're in it for profit. So uh, the, uh, if things are going very badly and you have a lot of people objecting and a lot of mace being used, that, that's money for the private corporations. The profit motive should not be a reason for surveillance of American citizens. And this coming back to the NDAA, which is where this question began, the National Defense, Authorization, Authorization Act. Act for 2012 uh, is a kind of legal cover for all of this, but I'm I, kind of stuck at bias. My, my 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 take on this, whatever there is in the NDAA, this whole situation is constitutional, unconstitutional, and above all, it's crazy. And I would like to say that this country, or or, or Washington, it's not so much the people that Washington is in a kind of collective paranoia, which uh, in a recent article of mine, I compared to the McCarthy era. That yes. it, it is a new kind of polite bureaucratic McCarthyism, which is fundamentally madness, and it's counterproductive. I mean, like the whole war on terror, uh, yes, we're killing some terrorists, but for every terrorist we kill, we're creating who, who knows how many more. And like the Boston Massacre, for example, Joe Carr, the, the younger of the two, uh, we call it the massacre, three people killed. That can happen with drones in Yemen in a week and nobody notices. Uh, but we certainly notice it when it's here. 
And Jokar wrote uh, inside the boat before he was captured that he was doing this because of what we are doing, what we did in Iraq and are still doing in Afghanistan. So if we really want to take some constructive, sane, logical steps to reduce the threat of terrorism, we could begin by not uh, inducing it in the Muslim world by these crazy, insane interventions. Mm -hmm.